Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about families. And for some of us, this may be a hard conversation, and that's why I wanted to do this video. Is because um, I'm suffering this, and there are several people who's making comments on our channel, you know, who seem to be suffering from this same thing, and that's the loss of our families. So I wanted to do something about that, something a class about the loss of our families. Now I'm over here on Google. Now this is a tip for you know some of you guys who are trying to learn the learn the Bible and different things in the Bible. The best way, of course, is to go ahead and read the whole thing for yourself. That's what I promote. Read the whole thing, every jot and tittle. You have to read it like a novel, like a book, you know. But another way you can get quick answers is over here on Google. You can type in questions in Google, and chances are, if you're thinking about it, somebody has already thought about it, and people have put up classes on it. People have put up web pages on the same subject that you're thinking about, and it's a good place to find Bible verses that you know line up. You know, but you know it is a good way to find out good information. Like I put in the in, the, in Google search, does the Bible say you will lose your family? And if you look, there are, what, 214 million hits that came up in less than a second. 214 million people have said something about the loss of your family, you know. And Google's able to pull this up really quickly. Now, there's one that I've skimmed over. Let me show you that one. Now, my, my page looks a little bit different because I have my images turned off in the settings on my Chrome. There, you can turn the images off. So you don't, it doesn't quite look like it may appear on your computer, but you can find this exact website right here. And this is the one that, like I said, I skimmed it. And this is the one I'm going to use for this little class here. These are all of the missing pictures that would have been, you know, flashing in your face. Um, but it's uh, crosswalk.com is where this is coming from. And it says three teachings about Jesus and family you need to understand. Yeah, you need to understand. You know, if you are in the middle of this walk or if you're just starting this walk, this is something you're going to understand. And that's what you can expect from your family. <clears throat> Not all of you may suffer this, but if you do suffer this, you want to be forewarned because it is very painful. It is very hurtful. Um, let me start off. I may not read the whole thing, but we'll see. He says in a DesiringGod.org article titled, If You Don't Hate Your Father, You Cannot Be My Disciple, John Piper writes, Radical obedience to Jesus revitalizes natural relationships. <clears throat> now, that seems like contradictory contradictory a little bit there if you don't hate your father you cannot be my disciple and then that comes right out of the word that comes right out of the word and you know they spelled they highlighted each one of these words so it adds a little bit of confusion but that word right there is really daddy if you don't hate your daddy because nobody will hate your father remember we have a universal father we all share the same father but he's talking about your daddy and your mama here you know the loved ones the people that you can see well, let's go on. He says, these relationships could be between parents and children, siblings, marriages, best friends, etc. Our relationships to Jesus must be above any natural relationship we have, and we must follow him at all costs. Yeah, at all costs. If, you know, if we're about to lose our families, if we're about to lose our friends, we still can't, you know, give up on what we understand to be true. We have to, to, to wade through those, 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 um, those waters, too. Um, he says, not all families will be happy and supportive about one of their own following Jesus. You may be in one of those families where you are the only follower of Jesus and your beliefs may be met with hostility and possibly silence. Now, I can speak on this one because it's the boat that I'm in. Um, the only one, the, the only one around, the only one that I know that actually follows the, the scripture, the Bible, you know, there's a whole lot of them, a whole lot of them, are, you know, calling themselves Christians and saying they, um, they love the Lord and all of that. But when you pull out the Bible, when you pull out Exodus, Leviticus, and you start talking about commandments and rules and statutes, they quick to say, no, I don't do that. I, uh, uh, I don't, I don't do that. And, uh, and, um, one could question, well, do you actually love them? But let's go on. God's word tells us we must choose truth and obedience over 
sentimentalism and comfort once your heart has been transformed by the power of the gospel no earthly relationship you have will ever be the same Piper explains some will be exquisitely deeper and happier as we discover who our true family is whoever does the will of God he is my brother and sister and mother as coming out of mark 335 some will be shattered a person's enemy will be those of their own household which comes out of matthew chapter 10 verse 36 now <clears throat> these are these are important verses to to understand here um because this is this is what we're suffering through this is what's what's going on now he's saying that some of these relationships this is the piper talking saying that some of the relationships will become exquisitely deeper and happier um it, the only example I can give of this is my immediate family, my my wife and my sons and my daughter that live in my house. The, the closer our uh, relationship to him gets, the more we become a bonded unit, the more we realize that, you know, it's just really us, you know, and so our relationship with each other becomes stronger. But for the rest of my family is the opposite is true you know what it says some will be shattered yeah you know a lot of a lot of the relationships that we have with our family members will be shattered as they you know reject the father and, and feels like they reject us but you know it it, it those relationships will, will not get better all right, here, let's see, let's go on. He says, here are three ways Jesus revitalizes our relationship with others in the Gospels. Okay, now, I'm choking on this word revitalizes because I haven't, I haven't seen any revitalization since I've been on this walk. It's been, it's been um, the opposite of revitalization of, of my relationships, you know, since 1990-something, you know, um, it's like I've lost just about every family member, including the ones I just was, you know, praising for, you know, our relationships getting better. At one point, those were rocky. It's just getting better now. <clears throat> so I'm tripping on that word revitalizes. Let's look at let's look at one. He says we may be called to leave our family. He's quoting Mark 10 verses 28 through 30. He says, then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Yeah, so we get that stuff back. What he's saying is that we will get we'll get our family members back. Um, but they may be different, whereas I've had to give up my good relationship with my biological sister here on Earth. In the end, you know, I will have good relationships with hundreds of spiritual sisters kind of deal. You know, what, it, what I'm hearing out of it. Matthew Henry's commentary explains the greatest trial of a good man's constancy is when love of Jesus calls him to give up love to friends and relatives, even when the gainers of Christ let them still expect to suffer for him they till they receive heaven yeah so this is this is one of the greatest trials of our walk guys like i said some of you guys have felt this in the past you're over it now i'm almost over it now i'm like you know right there it just the only thing i got to do now is you know turn off the lights and close the door and i'll be done with this thing pretty much but some of you are hot and heavy into this you're still feeling you're still trying to hold on to your families and it's not working out well for you um and, and it's a great trial the greatest trial of a good man's constancy is when love of jesus calls him to give up love of friends and relatives when you have to give up your love for your friends and your relatives will be your biggest trial that's going it has been for me it has been for me that's that's probably been the hardest part of it all is having to give up the love of my my family and my friends you know that part really really sucks but you know let's go and john wesley's explanatory note state he shall receive a hundredfold houses etc not in the same kind 
for it will generally be with persecutions but in value a hundredfold more happiness than any or all of these did or could afford but let it be observed none is entitled to this happiness but he that will accept it with persecutions yeah so if I'm understanding mr. Wesley there is that okay we're gonna get this stuff a hundredfold but it's going to be different, not of the same kind, and it's going to be laced with persecutions. And the only way we can get what we're owed, you know, we're owed this. The Bible says if you give up this, you will get it back a hundredfold. So, you know, I'm going to be one of the persons standing up saying, hey, where is it? You know, where is it? You know, where, where is what you owe me? But what it says there is... Um, according to Mr. Wesley, is and I and I believe this scripture. I believe the scripture supports what he says. None is entitled to this happiness, but he that will accept it with persecutions. I Meaning you have to accept the persecutions too. You have to understand that okay, you've given up the love of your family. They're going to persecute you, but you have to endure this in order to to get that hundredfold family back. You know. Though there will be persecutions, there will be blessing in the body of believers now and into eternity, as Piper comments. Even though there is greater gain, the loss is still loss, at least temporarily. Jesus wants us to learn to depend entirely on our Heavenly Father, who will always take care of us. Now, see, this is, this is, this is where I'm at in this walk here. It's like I'm starting to understand that... I have been separated from my family in order so I can live without them in order so I can you know I'm not dependent on my family I don't I don't have any family to depend on now so in the heat of the battle you know I'm I'm not going to be tempted to say hey uh daddy hey mama hey sister hey brother will you help me I've learned over these past years that you know there is no phone call that I can make other to my heavenly father and it seems like it was set up that way to teach me this lesson like I had to go through um, the separation of, of my mama and my daddy so that you know I can learn not to depend on my mama and my daddy is what it kind of kind of kind of seems like to me you know um, I don't want to give too many personal examples. Some of them go. He says, we may be called to see our family as our enemy. And now he's quoting Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 and 39. And we just did a um, little short class on. No, it wasn't short. It was about an hour long on um, Matthew chapter 10. But it says, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Yeah, guys, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. He did not come to to bring peace in your family. You, if you, you are a follower of Christ. You're trying to be obedient to the word. Well, there went the peace. The moment you stood up and said, you know, like um, Exodus chapter 24, verse 7. As the Lord has said, so will we do and be obedient, something like that. The moment you said you would be obedient to the Father, the peace went away in your house. And a war started. A war started between your father, what is it, your father, your daughter, um, your mother, your daughter-in-law, your mother-in-law. That's when the war started. And, you know, he's saying here, he didn't he didn't come to make it peaceful. He didn't come to, you know, make your life in there peaceful. He came to to disrupt it, to stir it up. And it actually needs to be stirred up. It really does, because if not, it's it's, it's, it's going to be destructive for everybody involved. If if these people's comfort level is not shaken before the tribulation, 
they're going to find themselves without their weapons for this spiritual warfare. They're not going to have time to gain them. They're not going to have time to acquire the necessary knowledge and skills they need in order to survive the floodwaters of hate, selfishness, greed, um, and stuff that's coming on, on the world. So whenever you find yourself in your family um, being obedient to the word, you're you're kind of like an agitator. You 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 are agitating the waters. You are disturbing the waters. You're kind of making it so that you're adding stress to the environment, um, making way for the possibility of change. Maybe some of these people will change, but. You know, if 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 it was a peaceful environment, well, you would sit there in your room reading your Bible all day and nobody would ever know what was going on. And then you would not be a benefit to those people. You know, they they would just go on. And then actually, at the end, you would be of Q. You would be accused of, you know, failing these people like the, I can't remember what verse it was, but it says that if you don't tell the people what's coming ahead for them, then you will be guilty of their blood their blood will be on your hands you know if you know that this thing is coming to harm them and you let it come on them without so much as telling them that this thing is coming to to harm them then their blood is on your hands so we are commanded I, I would say commanded to tell these people to tell our loved ones to tell our friends our daughters our mothers our mother-in-laws the truth you know, this is this is this is what's going on. We have the obligation to tell them what's going on. But when we do so, it's going to disturb them. It's going to disturb their comfort level and it's going to bring they're going to retaliate against you. You know, they're going to fight back and, you know, say hurtful things like, you know, you don't really know what you're talking about or, you know, it just just hurtful things. You you know what they are. I ain't got to repeat them anyway. As the NIV study Bible comments, this is a f this of course does not mean that Jesus came to start wars. Hmm, well, let's contradict you what I just said. I just said he came to start wars. But okay, <laughs> but that there would be some families where not every member would believe. The sword represents the interpersonal hostility that can occur within families. I disagree with this statement here. You know, he says that he didn't come to start wars. Well, it actually says it up here. Um, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. So he came to bring a sword. So how can you then come back down here and say he did not come to start wars? You know, if you bring in a sword, you, you gonna start a war. You bring a sword to my house. It's going to be a fight. I promise you, you know what? I'm just going to let you cut me. No, I'm going to fight. He says, we know that parts of Jesus's mission on earth was to bring peace. As we read in Luke 2:14, John 16:13, John 14:27, Luke 19:42, Acts 10 and 36, and Ephesians 2 and 17, Piper writes. Okay, so I'm gonna have to go read these because, like I said, it feels contradictory to me. One minute you say he didn't come to bring peace, now he comes to say he comes. I'm gonna pick one of them at random just for grins and giggles. Luke 2 and 14 says, "Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those." Whom have favor and rest. So that's peace to his people. <clears throat> I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's John 16 and 13. But again, it's talking to peace for my people. You know, peace for his people. John 14 and 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So I disagree. I'm in total disagreement with what this is saying here. It's OK. You know, like we said at first, you know, this is a website where people, you know, give their personal opinion. And, you know, mine could be wrong, too. But it to me, it's not saying here. He did not. He says we know that part of Jesus' mission on earth was to bring peace. Well, he should have. He, sh he should have kept going and said peace to his people. He didn't come to bring peace on earth. No, this whole earth is about to go through a war, through, through a lot of hardship and pain, you know. And if you think, if, if somebody thinks that the Messiah came to bring peace and then they look out their window and see war, then they may think, oh, well, Jesus failed. You know, he, he, he kind of um, uh, dropped the ball somewhere. Ain't it? You know, he came to bring peace and we're in a war. No, he didn't come to bring peace. 
he he offers peace to those who are within his will but the rest of the world hmm, it's a war but let's go on piper writes jesus offers himself as peace but when supreme love for him is not shared in a family he becomes a divider yeah and so you know this this kind of brings us back to what i believe the truth is is that you will have peace as long as people are obedient but when you have um those in your family that want to be disobedient you're going to go to war with them you you have to go to war with them because they're going to fight they're going to defend themselves they're going to attack you and you either uh fight fight back or give in and giving in is not really an option giving in is not really an option you know you can't you can't do that you can't acquiesce to their side you can't say okay well you know i'm gonna put my bible down and you know we're gonna all get along that that's not really an option for the father's people not really <clears throat> let's go on some family members will not love jesus more than they love their family and despite his offering of peace they will not make him supreme part of taking up your cross means embracing the pain of relational brokenness for christ's sake says piper yeah now i agree with this this cross that we have to embear this is part of the cross the loss of your family members the the um, lack of peace inside of your own home and you're having to endure that is part of the cross that we all must must bear I do agree with what he's saying there. but notice what he's saying here he's kind of trying to straighten up that whole peace thing he says some family members would not love Jesus more than they love their families and despite his offering of peace offering of peace they will not make him supreme yeah so the peace thing is is it, it comes with like like he's saying there when he, when we make him supreme we're not just supposed to have peace just because we're down here we can be rebellion rebellious and have peace now that peace and rebellion don't really go together um let's go here in C.S. Lewis's work of fiction, okay, this is fiction, The Great Divorce, he describes a mother who loves her son more than God. In a fictional purgatory, the mother was met by a believer who told her if she could just learn to love God more than her son, she would be able to enjoy freedom in heaven. But she could not understand why her son was not with her and why God would keep him from her. She even went as far as saying she would rather have her son in hell with her because at least they would be together. Yeah, guys, there, there are people doing this. They may not say it in this way. They may not. And this is a fictional writing. And it's probably, you know, a little far fetched to actually hear these words come out of somebody's mouth. I'd rather be in hell with my son. Um, but that's what we're that's what they're doing. That's what we're doing. You know, when we when we put aside when this this fictional lady, when she puts, you know, aside her beliefs in order to, you know, have good relationships with her son, that's what she's doing. She's choosing hell. And why is she choosing hell? Because she wants the love of her son. It's, it's actually true. God will not settle for second best or even tying the first. No, he but what you really have to understand is who God is. Go to John chapter 1 verse 1. You'll find out that God is the word. The word is God. You know, so what that means to me is that his instruct when when you say you love him then you love his word you love his instructions you love his statutes his order his ordinances all of the things that he's put here in 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 these biblical texts that's what you love not some generic god is obedience to the word that he's talking about here obedience to to the, the but what i was saying was is that these this word that we're talking about is actually instructions for survival of the tribulation i put in a video not too long ago where i explained how we're not being we're not being held accountable for our sins and our transgressions right now we we are doing things a lot of the things we're doing are in error simply because we don't know the rules of the bible but nobody's being harmed for it you know the bible tells us in the second commandment not to make images uh you know not to you know take pictures of anything that he's created well everybody has a cell phone we're all snapping away you know today is the sabbath day 
you know, for me. But if I would, but I was outside a few minutes ago and I noticed a pile of leaves that I had not gotten up. You know, I raked the yard the other day and I put all of the piles and I burned them all. But, you know, I'm looking down and I'm like, dang, I left this little pile right here. Now, if, if you know, for some reason I want to, you know, grab my rake and my shovel and my wheelbarrow and pick that little pile of leaves up and carry them where they're supposed to go. You know, is a bunch of people going to show up and start hitting me with rocks? You know, is lightning going to come and strike me? No, it's not. We're not being held accountable for um our transgressions right now the day of accountability is not here yet there's going to come a day when yes i find myself out there doing something i'm not supposed to do and there is going to be a rock that's going to hit me or lightning or you know something bad is going to happen to me just not yet it's is really when the tribulation is hot and heavy that you're going to find these rules and statutes of the bible um as a benefit to you you know, for a lot of people, they seem like burdens and they don't want this in their life kind of thing. But when the stuff starts coming out of the sky, when the earth starts opening up because of earthquakes, when hot lava starts rolling towards you because of, you know, the volcanoes, when the bugs start biting on you or you start finding yourself in famines and various diseases, you're going to appreciate what you've learned in the scripture because it is those rules that's going to actually help you survive the thing how do you deal with your brother how 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 do you you know keep from getting into you know arguments and fights and stuff because you know right now a argument and a fight may end up with you know somebody's feelings get hurt but when the love can, when the love has gone away is going away now the promise is that the love is going to go away. Those arguments and fights are going to get people killed. I mean, you see evidence of it already. People, you know, getting shot in road raids and people, you know, being killed for little small and stuff. It's going to get worse. What we learn in the scripture is that the love of many will wax cold, meaning the, the whole earth is going to start hating on each other. And it's going to it's going to be a lot of violence and, and, and stuff going on. But, you know, let me go. On. First, is that part three? Uh, and this is the last one, I believe he says, we may be called to hate and renounce our family. Look at Luke 14, 26 through 27 and 33 says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Anyone of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. See, the father knew we would be here in this time period, 2018, 2019, 2020, 21. He knew we would be in this environment when the tribulation came on us. He put these he put the Bible here as our instructions, as our guide to help us get through the tribulation. But he knew the environment. In which we will be in when the tribulation presented itself. And what is it? Our environment of luxury, our, our environment of televisions, an environment of Walmart, an environment of you know abilities to, of credit. We can we can pretty much get anything we want, you know, and and need anytime we want to. Well, this lifestyle or civilization, as we call it, is 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 widespread. It covers the world. Everybody. Everybody is living this kind of lifestyle now, and he knew we would, you know, some of us would wake up to this environment. And what is, and when we find ourselves in this environment, we're going to pre be presented by loved ones who are going to be contrary to what the scripture says. They're going to be telling us to do opposite. They're going to want us to do the way they're do doing. They're going to want us to do the same thing that we've always been doing. They, they're going to want us to be like them. And when the opportunity presents itself, they're going to they're going to come in and they're going to say, um, you're wrong. You should be like me. If you want my love, if you want me to be a part of your life, if you want your mama back, if you want your sister back, 
you need to stop acting the way you're acting and go back to acting the way you used to before you found that Bible thing. And you need to be that guy again if you want our relationship. So you, you're faced with, a, you're faced with a choice there. Do I choose the love of my daddy or do I choose the love of my father? You will be presented with a choice. And, and what he's saying there is if you choose your daddy, if you choose your mother, if, if you say, okay, my mom thinks I'm crazy and I should go to an insane asylum and you go down there and say, you know what, I'm going to start taking these pills in order so I can have the relationship with my mother. You, 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 you're not worthy of him. You've basically ran back to their side. And when it all goes down, you're going to find yourself without the necessary protections that you need in order to survive. It ain't so much as he's going to reject you. You have rejected yourself. You've chosen the other path. You've chosen the path of destruction because you wanted your, your sister's love. Because you loved your sister or your wife. You loved your wife so much that you said, you know what? I'm just going to you know, forget about all of this and just, just, just live, you know. You're not worthy. You're not going to survive. You're not going to find yourself in the kingdom of heaven. You forget about it. You know, you chose the other side, you know. Anyway, let's go. On. Just as we read in other scriptures that Jesus did not come to bring peace, but the context of what he was saying in Matthew 10 was for division in families. So we face a similar concept and context here in Matthew 19 and 19, Matthew 22 and 39, Matthew 5 and 44 and John 13 and 35. We read about our command to love and honor others. Okay, now you guys go ahead and look up those look up those verses. He says, so you so how can we understand this statement to hate and renounce? The first step is to read John 12, 24 to 25. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Piper explains the meaning here. And it, this is this is the big choice. This is the this is this is what causes the problems with you and your family is the choice. Do you want to have a good life now or do you want to have a good life later is what it boils down to. Now, I'm not saying which choice is right and which choice is wrong. That's up for any, each individual to decide. I'm saying is that the, the choice causes the problems because whereas, you know, my, my sister or I'm going to say my wife, my wife wants to have the good life now, you know, it's hypothetically speaking my wife wants to have the good life now she wants to have the luxury home she wants to have the luxury car she wants to have the nice clothes she wants to walk around with her jewelry on she wants to have get her hair done every day she wants to get her uh, nails done twice a week kind of deal she wants to live this life now where you know this luxurious life now well in order for her to do that she's going to give up the promises of the future you cannot have it both ways she she cannot go to the hairdresser and the nail salon you know and you know spin up you know hundreds and thousands of dollars you know a month to 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 keep herself beautified and then expect to walk the walk of the father and get the blessings in the end she you can't have it both ways and so when you when you find yourself around your family members this is where the problem comes is because you're sitting there. You, they all have brand new cars and you're walking. They they all have brand new tennis shoes and yours have holes in them. They all have luxury homes with air conditioners and garage door openers and cable televisions and microwaves and the and all the the the. the, the the worldly things, the comfort things of this world, they have those now. And then when you show up and you're saying, um, no, I gave all of that up so I you know, can have a future life. I, I don't really care about the things of this world now. I'm looking for the things ahead. Well, it's going to cause a rift between you guys. You know, not so much as your part. I believe it's their part because they have to stand back and look at their life and have to analyze, OK, well, is it possible that I could be doing something wrong? Now, I, we have. We've all stood back and said, asked the same question. You know, when we see them over there, you know, um, um, living a comfortable life and we look at ours as not being so comfortable, don't we ask the question? Don't we say, you know, is it possible that we could be doing something wrong? You know, don't we have to step back and analyze ourselves and look at, you know, how we're living and say, you know, are we wrong? You know? 
Well, they do the same thing. You know, we don't go to them and ask them, you know, we do it in our secret to ourselves. When we sit back in our room while we're sitting there feeling the pain, we, 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 we ask ourselves these questions. Well, they're asking themselves the same question, you know. And it, But the thing is, they don't have truth to go on. They don't have scripture to go on. And so it, it, it is, their answer is not so definite as ours. We know for sure. Yep, I'm 100% sure I'm doing the right thing. Are you, you know, are you 100% sure that, you know, you, you're on the right path? And so it, it causes a disturbance. It causes a disturbance. Whether you say anything to them or not, you know, it's going to cause a disturbance. It's, it's, and it is. And it's going to bring some of this, some of this, um, some of this hate that we're talking about. And, and you, you, it's going to make it necessary for the renunciation, I believe. We will be called upon to make choices in this world that look as if we hate our lives and in the sense of caring very little for their well-being. For example, we may have to die for Christ. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. That's uh, Revelations 2 and 10. To the world, this will look like the ultimate self-hate. Throwing your life away for a myth. Jesus said it is a kind of hate, but it's also a way of preserving our lives for eternal life, which is a very radical form of love for our lives. Yeah. So it looks like self-hate, he's saying here, and, you know, I can agree with that. It, when, when you see a person who was once making hundreds of thousands of dollars of ye, a year driving around in luxury cars, now living, you know, homeless or in a tent somewhere, you know, it's like, wow, why did you do that to yourself? And, you know, the first thing they want to do is come help you get a job. You know, let me take you down to the unemployment office. You're like, I don't want that anymore. I've given up that life. I don't want that life anymore. It comes across as self-hate for them. Like, why would you do that to yourself? What, what's wrong with you? You threw, you threw away your life. What does he say? Throw it away your life for a myth. This is what they think of the scripture, guys. They ain't going to say it, but they actually think it. They believe it. They believe it's just a myth. It's just some made up stuff. You know, man wrote it and, you know. You can follow it if you want to, but, you know, you'd probably be better off, you know, just, you know, forgetting about it kind of thing. And so they, they, they act like you're throwing your life away for a myth. And it's like, hey, this is the scripture. This is the Bible. This is the father you're talking about. This ain't no myth. This is what's real. That, that, that what you understand is not quite as real as you think it is. This over here is what's actually real. But they, they, they won't see that. Not yet. They will eventually they will eventually, you know, but just not yet. Similarly, when Jesus says we cannot be his disciples unless we hate our fathers, he probably means something similar. That is, we may be called on to do things that look as though we hate our fathers when in fact we long for them to join us in eternal life. It's just it's, 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 it's just it's just who you're going to listen to is what it boils down to when you're and, and I hate the way they use the word father here because it's adding confusion. Remember, we have a universal father. That biological guy is not our father. He is our daddy. And there is a big difference. He's our daddy. And I wish they would use the word daddy here, you know, instead of father, because it adds confusion. Nobody with a right mind would ever think of having, you know, of hating the, the, the father in heaven, the one that created the heaven and the earth, you know, but that's kind of what it, you know, it, it feels like when I, every time I see that word father, it, I, I think of him, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about our daddy. Um, Jesus says we cannot be his disciples unless we hate our daddy. He probably means something similar. That is, we may be called on to do things that look as though we hate our daddies when, in fact, we long for them to join us in eternal life. Yeah, it 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 does. So you you and and this is this is what this is what you want. You want for your family to be there with you. You know. The, the 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 promises of the Bible, you know what it says, you know what's about to happen and you want your loved ones to be there with you. They would not be your loved ones if you did not. If you didn't if you didn't want them to enjoy the kingdom of heaven with you, if you didn't want them to survive the tribulation and be standing right there with you, can you really call them your loved one? They probably ain't, you know, but at the same time, you 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 have to. 
get away from their ideology you have to get away from their belief system you have to reject their beliefs and what they think feel and believe about what's going on and it's about to take place and focus more on what the scriptures say you have to reject them that word hate there is strong that's a strong word you know you know but you know you, you have to understand what's behind that word you know it's rejection of you know it's rejection of of theology ideology and i wish i had something better so let me see as an example for believing parents it can be very hard to watch their child leave and go live in another country for missions and sometimes this means they will not be able to take care of their aging parents now imagine how this would look to a non-believing family when their child leaves them to live in another part of the world it could look like hate to those who do not believe and love Jesus yeah you know, it, 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 and, and it may not be so much as going to another country. It could make it be going to another state. You know, if, if your parents live in the city and, you know, downtown New York and you wake up, one of the first things you're going to realize is New York is not the place to be. This ain't the place to be going into this tribulation. So if you want to leave and go to another place. It's going to feel like to them like you've left them. It could look like hate to those who do not believe and love Jesus. Yeah, it looks like you rejected them, you know, and it's like, you know, they moved away, you know, forget about them. They moved away. Jesus knows what he's doing when he uses a strong word like hate and talking to his disciples. It is an extreme perspective to test them. The radical sayings of Jesus expose our self-protective reflex, Piper says. Yeah, it's, it is a strong word, you know. But, you know, once you get behind what it means, you, you know, you, you're not really allowed to hate anybody. You're not even really allowed to hate your enemies, you know. So we have to really understand this word here. And, it, and it, what is it saying? It's a radical word. The radical saying of Christ expose our self-protective reflex. Yeah, so it, 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 it kind of irks us. It kind of prompts us kind of makes us you know it, it kind of jerks us that's a that's a provocative word hate you have to hate them yeah that's a provocative word meant to provoke us meant to make us think meant to make us become aware of what's going on it's like okay if you used a much softer word then it wouldn't it wouldn't it, it wouldn't have such an effect and any softer word would not have had the effect if we you need that effect because you need that understanding and and of, of what's actually going on as believers will say, I chose you over everything and everyone else, Jesus, without hesitation. Will we be okay with others possibly misunderstanding our actions and wondering why we are not doing certain things for our family and putting family first? No, they ain't gonna understand. They they ain't gonna understand at all. What to they to them? It, like I said earlier, it's a myth to them. The scriptural walk is a myth to them. It's a joke to them. It's like ridiculous. It's like from some fairy tale stuff that they don't believe in. And so when they're saying, "Hey, son, I need for you to come over here and mow my grass tomorrow," and you say, "No, tomorrow's the Sabbath day. I can't mow your grass tomorrow." <laughs> what are they thinking? They they yeah, what? He telling me that you know he can't do. He can't help me out. He can't help me out because of some, you know, stuff that he involved in, you know. Anyway, though you may never have to make such painful choices, there are Christians all around the world who make such choices every day. When they trust Jesus, they must leave their old life behind. They can no longer follow the same traditions and rituals. For many to re return home would be to meet death. By breaking with their family tradition, they are viewed as destroyers and haters. As believers, we are called to be faithful unto death. Revelations 2 and 10. Our faith must take precedence over all things, even what we hold most dear. Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind is Christmas. Christmas. You know, when you were out there in the world and you were celebrating Christmas, it seemed like your family loved you. It did. I, I, I test to it. Write it down in the comments. You know, people would come from out of town to come to your Christmas parties, sit there in your house and, you know, de help you decorate your, cre your tree and all of that stuff. Bringing in toys after toys for the kids and gifts everywhere. But now that you have rejected that. You don't want no part of those pagan rituals anymore. 
now come Christmas time, you know, you don't hear you don't hear from nobody. They don't they they don't do anything. It's like okay, do they call you after Christmas and say, yeah, I know you don't celebrate Christmas celebrations, but you know we did want to share some of the family love with you. No, they don't. They they ain't gonna call you. They they they. It's like it's like you're no longer a member of their family anymore. It's like it's like you're not a part of it anymore. You're not a part of this family. You got away from our pagan rituals. Now you've gotten away from us. You're no longer a member of this family. They're not going to say that. They're just going to do it. It's just going it's just going to happen. That's just what you're going to see. If you ask them about it, they're going to say, you know, they're going to give up some excuses. But, you know, wait till next year. See what happens. Piper wisely concludes, whatever you do. Don't domesticate the radical teachings of Jesus. If they make you uncomfortable, let them do their work. They are designed to create real disciples who are ready to lose all and gain Christ. The world may call it hate. They may call it foolishness. It is not. It is love. And it is the wisdom of God. See, what we're working for. See, you, you're giving up your family. You're giving up your loved ones. You're giving up your friends. You're giving up your houses. You're giving up your luxury cars. You're giving up your 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 spending power or you know whatever it is that you have to give it up. But you have to remind yourself what you're getting out of it. You're not giving it up just so you can die in poverty. That's not what we're planning on doing. That's not what we're doing here. We are in we are going to inherit the earth. Two thirds of all humanity is about to die. There are seven billion people on the planet. That's more than five billion people. If I do my math right, five billion people are about to go away from here. They're about to go in a dirt hole, many of which are going to stay there for one thousand years until and until the, the millennial age is over. They're going to sleep. Be in rest or whatever you want to call it. They'll be in a spiritual valley for a thousand years. What are the rest of us going to be doing? The ones who gave up all of this, the ones who suffered all of these persecutions and gave up our loved ones and had to deal with such hate. What are, what are we going to get out of it? We actually get to get to stay here. This earth becomes ours now. We get to rule the planet. We, we become kings of this planet. You ain't got no rulers no more standing over you talking foolishness and, and got you going to war and, you know, trying to make you eat poisonous food or whatever. All of that goes away with the evil people. You live in a world where there is no 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 diseases. You live in a world where there is no hate. You live in a world where there is no poverty, where there is, you know, no sin. You, 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 we This is what we're working for, and we have to remind ourselves of this. This is what we're going for, you know. It may look bad for us now only because you're materialistic and you think money is the only important thing on the world and I don't have any so it looks bad to you now but you know look at me a year from now look at me two years from now come see me after the tribulation if you're still here and take a look at what you see then and I promise you it's going to look different it's going to look different so we have to stay working for that crosswalk.com contributor Eric McKitty writes in John's vision of the seal judgments, the fifth seal depicts the souls of those who have been martyred because of their witness for Christ. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little while. That's Revelation chapter 6, verse 10 through 11. In Revelations... White clothing represent a pure life. Okay, before he gets off too far, let me come back up here and talk a little bit about, about what this is. These are people who've actually died because of, you know, because of the persecutions or in the middle of the persecutions. And they are in the Spirit Valley now. They they are what, you know, a, what, a, you know, somebody might call a ghost. They're, they're spiritual beings. They have no shell. They, they've died and they're in the spirit. But, they're, but, they're, but they are there and they're crying. How long is this going to go on? How long are these people going to keep being able to hurt the father's children? How long are they going to be in control of this world? How long is this is this Piscean age going to last? Is forever? Come on, father. You, it's, it's been 2,000 years and we have been getting killed for your word all of this time while you know they seem to be um 
um, getting better. They seem to be getting more stuff. They technology is 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 increasing. Their comfort level is increasing. They getting food stamps and welfare and unemployment and 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 and, and, and all of this stuff. All of these good things that allow them to live these comfortable lives. While we, the ones who are quote doing it right, are being killed and slaughtered and living in poverty. Father, how long are you going to let this go on? Well. He tells them, you know, until the rest of your brothers die, until, I don't know if we're going to read it here, but he tells them the answer is that it ain't just about you. There's other people who have to suffer the same thing. I'm glad they wait. I'm glad for the ones that can, in the spirit world, that can hear me that, you know, are suffering this. I'm glad y'all waited for me. You know, I'm, I'm glad, you know, y'all stuck around long. Y'all, y'all waited. Give me a chance to get on this boat. You know, I appreciate y'all, you know, having to suffer for so long, but I'm here now. You know, I wish I had some cokes and some donuts to bring you know to you guys but you know thanks for waiting <clears throat> in revelations white clothing represents a pure life see revelations chapter 3 verse 4 through 5 7 chapter 7 verse 9 through 14 and chapter 19 verse 8 those who are persecuted are viewed as being in the wrong even evil by their persecutors amen to that but when we face opposition for our faith we can be assured that God regards us as righteous before him, knowing that God is pleased with us despite what others might say or think helps us persevere. Yeah, guys, this is this is this is what this is true. Those who are who are persecuted are viewed as wrong. They're saying that we're wrong. You you read that Bible and you do what it says, you're wrong. They even say that you're evil. It's like the Bible made you evil. You read your Bible and you became evil. Really? Yeah, but it's true. I can I can attest to this. I can attest that this is exactly what what what's going what goes on. <clears throat> we can be assured that God regards us as righteous before Him, knowing that God is pleased with us, despite what others might say or think, helps us persevere. <laughs> it may help a little, but it still hurts. It still hurts. You know what Jesus tells us about how the world works is often upside down from how non-believers see it. Our cultures will continue to change, but the word of God remains the same. All right, guys, this is Coaching the Fight with Hermes Academy. I hope you guys got something out of it. Um, guys, we have to continue to love our families. We have to continue to pray for our families. Uh, we do get credit for doing so. But, you know, we have to remember that we are different. We are different than them. Just because they are our mamas, just because they are our daddies or our brothers and our sisters, don't mean that we are actually of the same spiritual family. We have a different spiritual family. I am your spiritual brother, and I appreciate you being my spiritual brothers and my spiritual sisters out there. All right, y'all, looks like I got a few comments to um, look at, so I'm going to close this out. Godspeed. Hermes Academy. Power, patience, continence, and faith. We teach virtues.